Good morning and welcome to Kerry Baptist Church. My name is David, David McGowan. I'm one of the ministers here at Kerry and it's great to welcome you as you join us online as we are live streaming uh, this morning's service. And a particularly warm welcome to any who are visitors who are watching us uh, and people are joining us from, well, different parts of the United Kingdom uh, and indeed from other countries uh, around the world. And it's lovely to come together in order that we might worship God. Uh, don't rush away afterwards. We do have a Zoom meeting. We'll split those who wish up into smaller groups, uh, and then you have an opportunity to talk together uh, and to share together. So we'll give details about that uh, towards the end uh, of the service. It was great to have you here. If uh, you're a visitor and you want to know more about the church, then please do visit our church website. Uh, if you'd like further details, then do contact our church office, uh, and you can do that through the website. Just a couple of things to draw your attention to. Uh, next Sunday, we have a special guest service, uh, and James Muldoon, the other pastor here at Kerry, will be speaking uh, on the question, how could a good God allow coronavirus? How could a good God allow coronavirus? So that will be live streamed here from Kerry at 10.30 next Sunday morning. And we're also meeting this evening for our evening service. Again, that will be live streamed. Uh, and that's at 6.30. James Muldoon will be speaking, and we're continuing, indeed, completing our series looking at the life of the Apostle Peter. Well, we're going to sing, and we do that. The words will appear on the screen. You'll hear music. You'll hear people singing, and do feel free to join in at home. And our first song really focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us that Jesus is our Savior. He is the one who forgives us all our sins. He's the one who is able to give us strength in our weakness. He's the one who can soothe our sorrows. He's the one who drives away all our fears. Uh, and so we're going to sing together, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear.
Well, let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray together. Lord God Almighty, you are the living and the eternal God. You are the one who is the author and the sustainer of all things, and you alone deserve our worship. And it is right and fitting that we come. We come to praise you and we come to give thanks to you. We ask that you would forgive us if sometimes our worship is simply out of habit or out of a sense of duty if we come half-heartedly to worship you. And so we pray that you would stir up our hearts with greater love for you so that our desires match the words that are upon our lips as we sing, so that our worship is not false, that it is not insincere. We pray that our souls would truly long for you as we sing and speak to you, the living God, and as we hear your word. We have every reason to praise you because you have given us so many good things to enjoy. But we thank you for that best gift that you have given to us, namely the gift of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that he is to us. Thank you that his name is sweet to our ears. He's the one who sets us free from sin and death. He's the one who brings life in all its fullness. He's the one who gives us joy and peace and hope. He soothes our sorrows. He heals our wounds. He drives away our fears. And so we come this morning. We come in the name of Jesus Christ. We come to offer you our praise. We come to offer you our prayer. We want to be encouraged. We want to be strengthened as we hear you speak to us as we read your word, and as the Holy Spirit applies that truth to our lives. Father, we want to come humbly before you. We want to come acknowledging our wrongdoing and confessing our sin, admitting freely our many faults and failings, and asking you that we might know your mercy and grace in Jesus Christ, that you would forgive us, that you might cleanse us, and that you would renew a right spirit within us. And so we come seeking help from you, help for each day. We ask that you would supply us with strength, with guidance for the future, with patience and perseverance, that you would give us wisdom to know what is best. And so we ask that you would help us this morning, that we might be wholehearted in our worship, that we would give ourselves fully to you. We would do that not only today, here and now, but that we would do that in the days ahead, that we might live for your glory and pleasure. Here then, these are prayers. Draw near to us and bless us through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, it's time for our children's talk, and Bethany Cooper, one of our ministry trainees, is going to speak to the children and then introduce a children's song that follows. Over to you, Bethany. Hi, Kerry Kids. Um, I hope you're all safe and doing well. I wonder if any of you are missing wearing your school uniform at the moment. Now, why do schools make you wear school uniform? Well, it shows that you're part of the school, doesn't it? It helps you feel part of the group, of your class and of your school. Your uniform also shows other people that you belong to that school. It's a safe place that you can enjoy being a part of. I wonder if any of you can think of a time where perhaps you've been on a school trip outside of school and your class have to wear your uniform. Your teacher might say, now remember, when you're out about in this uniform, you are representing our school. We want to set a good example to the people outside. Well, what would happen if on that trip, somebody in your class starts calling people names? People walk past and they hear the mean words. What might they think of your school? Then maybe another person in your class accidentally on purpose begins to trip up other classmates and cause trouble. Again, People walk past and see children getting really hurt. What might they think of your school now? They might think, oh, I don't want to send my children to that school where children are nasty to each other. It doesn't show what the school is really like. It doesn't show that the school is usually a safe place that you enjoy being a part of. This nasty behaviour 
makes it look like a horrible place. No one would want to be a part of that, would they? Well, in today's true passage from the Bible, a man called Paul tells us that just like these children's actions say something about their school, when you're a Christian, your actions say something about what it's like being part of God's family. Because when other people see what we do, how we behave, that shows them something of what it means to be a Christian. You see, being a Christian means we are all part of one family, God's family. And we want other people to see how wonderful this family is. We want to show people what it's really like being part of God's family. Do you think that being mean and nasty to other people would make others want to join God's family? Well, why don't you listen out as David helps us think about this a little bit later on in the service. And don't forget to tune in to our Bible story on YouTube. This week it's brought to us by Hannah Mitchell. You can find it on YouTube in our Carey Kids playlist, along with the memory verses for this week. Maybe you could send in a video to the church office of you doing the memory verse. Maybe make it out of Lego or draw it or sing it, say it, do a craft. Catherine Machen showed us last week for the threes to sixes how to make it on card or paper. Maybe you could do that. What a brilliant way that would be of showing what it's like to be part of God's family. Encouraging other people as you speak true words from his word, the Bible. What a great way to show others how brilliant it is to be part of God's family. Now, God's word, the Bible, is so important, isn't it? And our next song is one by Awesome Cutlery. It sings about how God speaks to us through his word, the Bible, and why that is such great news for us. So why not get on your feet, do the actions, sing out loud and listen out for why God's word is so important. Thank you for listening and see you soon, hopefully. Bye.
Thank you very much, Bethany. Well, it's time now for our Bible reading, and the reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 1, and it's going to be read by Peter Wells. Peter Wells is one of the members here at Kerry Baptist Church, and at the start of the year, Peter had a stem cell transplant as part of his treatment for myeloma. And on Thursday, Peter had a follow-up consultation, and the consultant was very pleased with his progress uh, and believes that that uh, transplant has been a success. Uh, and so we're very thankful to God. So Peter is going to read our passage from Philippians chapter 1. Let us hear the word of God from Philippians 1, verses 20 to 30. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I should remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So reads the inspired inerrant word of the living God, for which we praise him. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, it would be very helpful to have a Bible open in front of you as we continue our series looking at this letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. And this morning we're looking at Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter from prison, probably in Rome, and his future hangs in the balance. He doesn't know whether he will be released from prison or whether he will be executed. He doesn't know whether he will live or die. But even though he is facing death, the Apostle Paul is not anxious. Why not? Well, because he knows that death will take him to be with Christ, which is better by far. However, in verses 25 and 26 of this passage, Paul seems confident that his life will continue and that one day he will be able to visit the Philippians again to encourage them and to help them in their Christian lives. But whatever happens to him, there are a number of things that Paul wants to say to the church in Philippi. And this morning, as we look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30, it's one long sentence in Greek, the original language of this letter. As Paul writes in those verses, there are three things that he is urging the Christians in Philippi to do. Three callings that he places upon them. And indeed, these three things are really relevant to every Christian. The first thing that Paul urges the Christians in Philippi to be is worthy representatives of Christ. Worthy representatives of Christ. Look at verse 27. Paul says, whatever happens, whatever happens to him, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, the city of Philippi was established as a Roman colony in 42 BC. Many Roman soldiers retired there after their fighting days were over. 
and the inhabitants of Philippi were very proud of their Roman citizenship. As Roman citizens, they were exempt from taxes. That's a good thing. And their human rights were protected by Roman law. It was a big deal to be a Roman citizen. Now, on Paul's first visit to Philippi, Paul and Silas, his companion, had been seized by an angry mob. They had been dragged before the magistrates, and the magistrates had ordered that Paul and Silas be stripped and beaten. And we read in Acts chapter 16 that they were severely flogged, and then they were thrown in prison without trial. In Acts 16 and verse 38, we're told that when the magistrates discovered that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. And they came in person to the prison in order to appease Paul and Silas. And indeed, they escorted them from captivity. Roman citizenship was a big thing in the city of Philippi. Now, in verse 27, the word that Paul uses there that's translated into English as conduct yourselves is a word that relates to citizenship. It's a Greek word from which we get the English word politics. It means to live as a citizen, to fulfill your obligations in the public realm, in wider society. So when, Peter, when Paul writes to the Christians in Philippi and says to them, conduct yourselves, he's speaking about them living out their lives in public rather than what they do in private. Paul wants the Christians in Philippi to be good citizens. Not only good citizens of Rome, but he wants them to be good citizens of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. They are to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul here is encouraging them to live out their Christian faith before their neighbors and within the community, within the city, in ways that commend the gospel. Their behavior in public must not bring the name of Jesus Christ into disrepute. Now, we were thinking of this earlier in the children's talk as Bethany spoke. If you're wearing your school uniform, then what you do in public will affect what people think of your school. When you're wearing that uniform, then the reputation of the school depends upon your behavior. I've just finished reading a book, a book about William Dodd. William Dodd was the American ambassador to Germany from 1933 to 1937. He lived in Berlin in that time when Hitler was really uh, increasing in, pro in power uh, and was really having a strong grip on the German nation. William Dodd and his diplomatic colleagues in the US Embassy in Berlin, they publicly represented the United States of America. What they said and what they did in Berlin affected international relations between the US and Germany. Now, as public representatives of Jesus, as Christians who are public representatives of Jesus, in the communities where we live, we need to be careful what we say and how we act. We are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. The local church is to be an embassy of the gospel. Kerry Baptist Church is an embassy of the gospel here in Reading. Our public conduct as a church and our public conduct as individual Christians is to be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, this calling has very wide application for us. It has relevance in the way in which we use our time and our money. It relates to our friendliness towards our neighbors, the way that we conduct business, the conversations that we might have in the workplace, our attitude and our actions towards those who are less fortunate within society, our involvement in the local community, our response to moral issues such as abortion or euthanasia and sexuality. I wonder if I were to speak to your neighbors or to your work colleagues, would they know that you are a Christian 
And if they do know that you are a Christian, what understanding would they have of the gospel of Christ? As they watch you, as they listen to you as you speak, what understanding would they have of the gospel of Christ? Would they know from your actions that the gospel of Christ is all about grace? It's all about undeserved forgiveness. Would they know from your actions that the gospel of Christ is about self-denial and self-sacrifice? Would they know from your actions that Jesus is at the center of your affections? Would they know from your actions that the spread of the gospel is at the center of your ambitions? Are you a worthy representative of Christ? Are you conducting yourselves publicly in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ? That's our first calling as Christians, to be worthy representatives of Christ. But then secondly, Paul urges Christians to be faithful soldiers of Christ, faithful soldiers of Christ. Now, as I'm sure we are all aware, 75 years ago, last Friday, on the 8th of May, 1945, Nazi Germany surrendered to the Allied forces. And over the weekend, we have been celebrating VE Day, VE Day victory in Europe. Of course, it would be another four months before finally uh, the Jap Japanese army was defeated. But we're celebrating 75 years ago the ending of the Second World War in Europe. And on that day, the British population celebrated the ending of the horror and the hardships of the previous six years. World War II had cost many lives and had left many people wounded both in the armed services and in the general population as a result of German bombs that had been dropped on many cities across the United Kingdom. But of course, 1945 was not the end of world war and conflict. War continues even today in places like Syria and Yemen and Afghanistan and Ukraine. Warfare requires both defensive and offensive action. Not only must ground currently occupied be defended and the advance of the enemy resisted, but also active attacks are to be made against enemy positions in order to gain ground, both defense and attack. Now, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul employs military language to encourage the Christians in Philippi both to stand their ground defensively, but also actively to contend for the gospel. Now, remember, many of those who lived in Philippi were retired Roman soldiers. They understood warfare. They were familiar with warfare. This imagery used by the Apostle Paul would resonate with them. Look at what Paul writes there in verse 27. Paul writes, then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. So the Christians in Philippi are to stand firm. They are to be steadfast in their refusal to compromise or to conform to the world in terms of their beliefs and their behavior. Paul commands them to hold fast to the truth as they live gospel-worthy lives, even as they face attack and even face persecution. They are to defend the truth. They are to stand firm. But at the same time as standing firm, they're also actively to contend for the faith of the gospel. They are to fight shoulder to shoulder as they strive together to see the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, advancing and making progress. Now notice how Paul here in verse 27 emphasizes the importance of unity. 
for the church to be doing this together uh, to fulfill their calling to be faithful soldiers of Christ. Firstly, Paul says they are to stand firm in one spirit. Stand firm in one spirit. Now, you could capitalize the word spirit and see here a reference to the Holy Spirit. Indeed, it is the Holy Spirit who will give us that strength, that power, in order that we can stand firm. Or it could well be a call for unity within the church. That certainly comes through in the second phrase that Paul uses. Paul says that they are to contend as one man for the faith of the gospel. The members of the church in Philippi are to be acting as one. They're, they are to be united. They're to be of one mind. They are to be like-minded. They are to have the same purpose as they contend together for the sake of the gospel. Now, maybe we feel a little embarrassed uh, by such fighting talk and this military imagery. But the reality is, as Christians, we are engaged in a battle, in a spiritual battle. As we've already seen, we are called to be worthy representatives of Jesus Christ. But we are to do that in a world that is hostile to gospel truth and which offers us many temptations that appeal to our sinful desires. And we also have an enemy, Satan, who is keen to sow doubt and discouragement and division in order to draw us away from Christ and to hinder the spread of the gospel. And we need to be alert to the dangers and the difficulties that we face as Christians. We must be ready to stand firm against criticism and condemnation for our beliefs and to endure ridicule and scorn for our ethics and our morality. Now, we cannot do this in our own strength. We need God's help. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, we're told that we must be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In our messages for the day over this past week, we have been looking at Isaiah chapter 40. And in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 22 and 23, we are reminded that God is the one who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. He is the one who is able to reduce the rulers of this world to nothing. He is all-powerful, and we can trust in him. And the more aware we are of God's power, then the less frightened that we will be by those who oppose us. Paul speaks in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 28 about not being frightened by those who oppose you. We need to remember, using the words of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. As faithful soldiers of Christ, we must stand together. We stand in God's strength, but we must stand together. We must encourage and help one another in our struggles as Christians against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, over the course of this weekend, there have been many stories told of those who fought in World War II and their memories, particularly of the end of the war. One soldier who served with the East Riding Yeomanry, speaking about his experiences fighting in Normandy after D-Day, said this. He said, the best thing about service life was the comradeship. The war was a time when everybody was out to help everybody else. Everybody would safeguard each other in any way if they could. I must also say that some of them laid down their lives to save other people in some cases. I believe comradeship was what won the war for us. Comradeship, camaraderie, it binds service people together. It's vital for the effectiveness of military units. Now, Paul himself knew the importance of gospel partnership. 
Paul wrote about gospel partnership at the beginning of this chapter. In chapter, uh, chapter 1 and verse 5, he spoke about the gospel partnership that he shared with those in Philippi. Well, we must work hard at cultivating this sense of camaraderie, this sense of comradeship within the church as we support and help one another in order that we might collectively, but also then individually, stand firm and actively contend for the faith of the gospel. We are to contend as one man for the faith of the gospel. We are much stronger together. We need unity, and that will help us then to stand firm as faithful soldiers of Christ. We're called to be worthy representatives of Christ. We're called to be faithful soldiers of Christ. And then thirdly, in these few verses, Paul urges Christians to be hope-filled sufferers for Christ. Hope-filled sufferers for Christ. In verse 29, Paul identifies two gifts that God has granted to us as Christians. You're very happy to receive the first gift, but perhaps not so happy to receive the second gift. Paul writes in verse 29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Firstly, God grants us belief on Jesus. God grants us faith that we might put our hope and trust in the Lord Jesus. We are saved by trusting in Jesus. God grants us faith to trust in Jesus. But then secondly, God also grants us to suffer for Jesus. And we might not welcome that so readily. You see, the reality is that those who believe on Christ are also called to suffer for Christ. Don't expect that when you become a Christian that suddenly your life on earth becomes much easier. That all your troubles and all your struggles will be over. The reality is that when you become a Christian, then often life becomes much harder. Now, when Paul is referring to suffering here in verse 29, he's not thinking about the headaches and the heartaches that we all experience in the course of everyday life. He's not speaking about those hard things that blight human experience, suffering that is common to all of humanity, things like disease and disability and accidents and natural disasters, all of those things that are part and parcel of living in this fallen world. No, Paul is referring here to suffering for Christ, suffering as a Christian, suffering because of your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's thinking about opposition and persecution that you would experience because you're a Christian. Now, Paul himself had suffered much for Christ. Years earlier, we were thinking about this just a moment ago, when Paul and Silas first came to Philippi, the account of that visit is found in Acts chapter 16. Paul was severely flogged. He was thrown into prison. Paul is writing this letter from prison. He speaks in chapter 1 and verse 13 of the fact that he's in chains. He's in prison now because he's a Christian. He's facing possible execution. But Paul's struggles, Paul's hardship, Paul's suffering is not unique or unusual to him. In verse 30, Paul says to the church in Philippi, you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. He says to the Philippians, you are suffering just as I have suffered and still am suffering. We're called to suffer for Christ. But what we need to remember as we suffer as Christians is that suffering for Christ is the prelude to glory. 
Because those who share in Christ's sufferings will also share in Christ's glory. We're told that in Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. And when our time on earth is over, when we die, as Paul has already told us in this chapter, we will go to be with Christ, which is better by far. As Paul writes in verse 21 of this chapter, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now there are only two eternal destinies for humanity. There is destruction and there is salvation. Paul writes about that in verse 28. Those who believe on Christ and those who suffer for him, they will be saved by God. But those who oppose Christians and oppose the faith of the gospel, they will be destroyed by God. Well, I hope that you are believing on Christ. Believing on Christ is the only way to be saved, to escape destruction. Have you acknowledged your sin? Have you confessed your sin to God? Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned and put your trust and hope in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Believe on Christ, and you will be saved. Those who believe on Christ are saved by God. But having come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, our ultimate destiny is secure, but for now, here on earth, we have yet to suffer for Christ. But we are hope filled sufferers for the Lord Jesus Christ because we are looking forward to glory. We know that to die is gain. It is to take us to be with Christ forever. And as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, eternal glory far outweighs all the light and momentary troubles of this present time. It is the hope of glory that will encourage us to persevere, to persevere despite suffering as we fulfill our callings to be worthy representatives of Jesus Christ and to be faithful soldiers of Jesus Christ. We want also to be hope-filled sufferers for Christ. So here in these four verses, right at the end of Philippians chapter 1, Paul identifies three callings for the Christians in Philippi, but for the Christians of every age. We're called to be worthy representatives of Christ. We're called to be faithful soldiers of Christ. And we're called to be hope-filled sufferers for Christ. Well, may God help us that we might fulfill these three callings as we seek to serve Christ and to live for him in this world. We're going to sing a song together. After we've sung, then we'll pray and we'll ask God to help us to fulfill these callings. The song is, O Church, Arise, and it describes the call of Jesus upon us. It's Jesus who calls us, well, to put our trust and faith in him, and then to love him and to serve him and to seek his glory. There's an acknowledgement that that will bring trouble into our lives. But we can find strength in God as we strive together with the help of the Holy Spirit to be those faithful soldiers of Christ. As the song puts it, we want to be an army bold. We want to be an army whose battle cry is love, who are reaching out with the light of the gospel into this world that is living in the darkness of sin 
and death. Join with us then as we sing together, O Church, Arise. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, we want to be those who serve the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We want to be faithful soldiers of Christ as we engage in this spiritual battle that is being waged around us and indeed even within us. But we thank you as we've been singing that the ultimate victory is secure because Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. And yet day by day, our experience is that we are fighting, indeed, even at times struggling against the world, the flesh, and the devil. But we want to be those who do stand firm for the truth. We want to defend the gospel. We don't want to compromise or conform with the world and its rebellion against you. Father, we recognize that we are weak. We need your strength. We need your help. We are so easily frightened by those who oppose the gospel. We need that strength, that power that you alone can give. Thank you that you are all powerful. Thank you that you are greater than the one who is in the world, that Satan is a defeated foe. So Father, we pray that you would supply us with that strength that we need, that you would give us grace for every hurdle that is ahead. We pray that you would help us to run the race of faith with much patience and with great perseverance, that you would fill our hearts and our minds with gospel hope, 
so that we are willing to endure suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ, conscious of that great glory that lies ahead. And so we pray that you would help us to be those who contend for the faith of the gospel, that we would strive together. We pray for our unity. We pray that we would experience that camaraderie within the church as we encourage and support one another, as we spur one another on to live those lives that are worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that by our actions and by our speech, that we will commend the Lord Jesus Christ to others, that people will have a better understanding of the grace, of the hope, of the life, of the peace that is available through Jesus Christ, just by the way that we live publicly in our community and in the workplace and amongst our friends. Father, we recognize that there are those in other parts of the world who are facing much greater trials than we are as Christians, those who are suffering much more for Christ. That We pray this morning for Christians in Pakistan, a country where their health care provision is so much less than is available, perhaps in the Western world. And for many Christians, they're right at the bottom of society. Many who are suffering really unduly as a consequence, who have lost employment, who have lost income. We pray for churches that are struggling, struggling to pay their pastors. Father, we pray for those who are working alongside Christians in Pakistan, organizations like Open Doors and the Barnabas Fund and Tear Fund. Father, we pray for your protection over your people. We pray that you would provide for their needs. We pray that you would strengthen them. We pray, Father, that you would sustain their witness. Father, we pray that many would come to know the gospel of grace through their faithful witness to Jesus. Father, we pray for some of the needs within our own congregation. We thank you for that consultation that Peter Wells had on Thursday, for the good news that he received, and we do pray for his continuing recovery. Uh, we pray that you would help him, that he would recover uh, fully, that he would regain strength. Keep him free from any disease or illness. We pray for Pete Jean, still in hospital, awaiting uh, to come home, and we pray that that might happen in the days ahead. We pray that the right equipment would be in place. Uh, Father, we pray that you would be with Pete, encourage him, strengthen him. And we pray, too, that you would be with Anne and encourage her. Father, we pray for Pat Sutton in Western Australia, who listens in most Sundays, who has had her appendix removed. We pray for her swift recovery. We pray that you would be with Pat and Bob. We've been asked to pray for Monica Taylor in Spain. And so, Father, we pray for her. We don't know her circumstances, but we pray that you might draw near to her and strengthen her and encourage her, we pray. Father, we pray for our nation. We thank you for this weekend in which we are looking back 75 years. We want to acknowledge that you are the one who controls all that is happening in human history. Thank you for that freedom that was secured through the uh, victory that took place in the Second World War. Father, we pray that you would help us to be those who live to promote peace. Uh, we pray that we as Christian people would be peacemakers in our communities. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be grateful and thankful for all the freedoms that we enjoy, particularly as Christian people here, and that we might exercise those freedoms fully. Father, we do pray for the vote that is to take place on Tuesday in Parliament related to proposed changes in abortion legislation in Northern Ireland. We pray for MPs we pray that they would recognize the views of the majority in Northern Ireland who are opposed to abortion, and we pray that a majority would vote against those proposals. Father, we do pray that you would help us to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that our church, and indeed other evangelical churches around this nation, would be embassies for the gospel that you would encourage us in our public life, yes, to live responsibly as citizens of the United Kingdom, but also that we might live those lives that are worthy of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be seen to be those worthy representatives of Christ our King, and that through our witness that others would come 
to know him. So, Father, we pray that we might ever live for your glory and for your praise. We thank you for our time here together. We ask now that you would continue with us as we fellowship together, as we talk with one another. Help us to encourage one another and spur one another on that we might love you more and that we would serve Jesus Christ, our Savior, more faithfully. Hear our prayers, we ask, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, our service is over, but please do stay on and join a Zoom meeting. If you are a regular member of the congregation here, then you will have received an email in the week, uh, well, yesterday, uh, giving you the link for that Zoom meeting. If you're a visitor and would like to join the Zoom meeting, uh, then please do put a note in the comments on Facebook and we'll send uh, the link or the password to you. Uh, what happens is you go into a, a larger meeting room and then you split, you're split up into smaller breakout rooms. Uh, and Sundeep is going to manage that virtual mingling area. So thank you very much, Sundeep, uh, for all that you do after our morning services. Uh, we are meeting again this evening, live streaming, 6.30 p.m. James Muldoon will be here completing our series in the life of the Apostle Peter, looking at Peter, the author, uh, the author of 1 Peter and 2 Peter letters in the New Testament. And please do join us next Sunday, next Sunday morning at 10.30 a guest service, how could a good God allow coronavirus? And that might be something that you would want to share more widely on social media and encourage others to join us next Sunday morning at 10.30. If you'd like to find out more about the church here, Kerry Baptist Church, then please do visit our website. And every Thursday we have a newsletter that goes out by email, Kerry News. And if you'd like to receive that regularly, then please do contact our church office. Thank you.